The Catcher in the Rye, Chapter 15. I didn't sleep too long because I think it was only around 10 o'clock when I woke up. I felt pretty hungry as soon as I had a cigarette. The last time I eaten was those two hamburgers I had with Brosser and Mac when we went to Agerstown to the movies. That was a long time ago. It seemed like 50 years ago. The phone was right next to me and I started to call down and have them send up some breakfast, but I was sort of afraid they might send it up with old Maurice. If you think I was dying to see him again, you're crazy. So I just laid around in bed for a while and smoked another cigarette. I thought of giving old Jane a buzz to see if she was home yet and all, but I wasn't in the mood. What I did do, I gave old Sally Hayes a buzz. She went to Mary A. Woodworth, and I knew she was home because I'd had this letter from her a couple weeks ago. I wasn't too crazy about her, but I'd known her for years. I used to think she was quite intelligent in my stupidity. The reason I did was because she knew quite a lot about the theater and plays and literature and all that stuff. If somebody knows quite a lot about those things, it takes you quite a while to find out whether they're really stupid or not. It took me years to find out in old Sally's case. I think I'd have found out a lot sooner if we hadn't necked so damn much. My big trouble is, I always sort of think whoever I'm necking with is a pretty intelligent person. It hasn't got a goddamn thing to do with it, but I keep thinking it anyway. Anyway, I gave her a buzz. First the maid answered, then her father, then she got on. Sally, I said. Uh, yes, who is this? She said. She was quite a little phony. I already told her father who it was. Holden Caulfield, how are you? Holden, I'm fine. How are you? Swell, listen, uh, how are you? Anyway, I mean, how's school? Uh, fine, she said. I mean, uh, you know. Uh, swell. Uh, well, listen, I was wondering if you were busy today. It's Sunday, but there's always one or two matinees going on Sunday. Benefits and that stuff. Would you care to go? I'd love to. Grand. Grand. If there's one word I hate, it's grand. It's so phony. For a second, I was tempted to tell her to forget about the matinee, but we chewed the fat for a while. That is, she chewed it. You couldn't get a word in edgewise. First, she told me about some Harbor guy. Probably was a freshman, but she didn't say, naturally. That was rushing hell out of her, calling her up night and day, night and day. That killed me. Then she told me about some other guy, some West Point cadet that was cutting his throat over a tube. Big deal. I told her to meet me under the clock at the bit more at 2 o'clock and not to be late, because the show probably started at 2.30. She was always late. Then I hung up. She gave me a pain in the ass, but she was very good looking. After I made the date with old Sally, I got out of bed and got dressed and packed my bag. I took a look out the window before I left the room, though, to see how all the perverts were doing, but they all had their shades down. They were the height of modesty in the morning. Then I went down to the elevator and checked out. I didn't see old Maurice around anywhere. I didn't break my neck looking for him, naturally, the bastard. I got a cab outside the hotel, but I didn't have the faintest damn idea where I was going. I had no place to go. It was only Sunday, and I couldn't go home till Wednesday or Tuesday the soonest. And I certainly didn't feel like going to another hotel and getting my brains beat out. So what I did, I told the driver to take me to Grand Central Station. It was right near the bit more where I was meeting Sally later. And I figured what I'd do, I'd check my bags into one of those strong boxes they give you the key to, then get some breakfast. I was sort of hungry. While I was in the cab, I took out my wallet and sort of counted my money. I don't remember exactly what I had left, but it was no fortune or anything. I'd spent a king's ransom in about two lousy weeks. I really had. I'm a goddamn spendthrift at heart. What I don't spend, I lose. Half the time, I sort of even forget to pick up my change at restaurants and nightclubs and all. It drives my parents crazy. You can't blame them. My father's quite wealthy, though. I don't know how much he makes. He's never discussed that stuff with me, but I imagine quite a lot. He's a corporation lawyer. Those boys really haul it in. Another reason I know he's quite well off, he's always investing money in shows on Broadway. They always flop, though, and it drives my mother crazy when he does it. She hadn't felt too healthy since my brother Ali died. She's very nervous. That's another reason why I like I hated like hell for her to know I got the axe again. <clears throat> After I put my bags in one of those strong boxes at the station, I went to this little sandwich bar and had breakfast. I had quite a large breakfast for me. Orange toast, bacon and eggs, toast and coffee. Usually I just drink some orange juice. I'm a very light eater. I really am. That's why I'm so damn skinny. I was supposed to be on this diet where I eat a lot of starches and crap to gain weight and all, but I never did it. When I'm out somewhere, I usually just eat a Swiss cheese sandwich and malt milk. It isn't much, but you get quite a lot of vitamins in the malt milk. H.V. Caulfield, Holden Vitamin Caulfield. While I was eating my eggs, these two nuns with suitcases and all, I guess they were moving to another convent or something, were waiting for a train, came in and sat down next to me at the counter. They didn't seem to know what the hell to do with their suitcases, so I gave them a hand. They were these very inexpensive looking suitcases, the ones that aren't genuine leather or anything. It isn't important, I know, but I hate it when somebody has cheap suitcases. It sounds terrible to say it, but I can even get to hate somebody just looking at them if they have cheap suitcases with them. Something happened once. For a while, when I was at Elton Hills, I roomed with this boy, Dick Slagle, that had these very inexpensive suitcases. He used to keep them under the bed instead of on the rack so that nobody would see them standing next to mine. It depressed holy hell out of me, and I kept wanting to throw mine out or something, or even trade with him. Mine came from Mark Cross, and they were genuine cowhide and all that crap, and I guess they cost a pretty penny, but it was a funny thing. 
here's what happened. What I did, I, I finally put my suitcases under my bed instead of on the rack so that old Slago wouldn't get a goddamn inferiority complex about it. But here's what he did. The day after I put mine under my bed, he took them out and put them back on the rack. The reason he did this, it took me a while to figure out, was because he wanted people to think my bags were his. He really did. He was a very funny guy that way. He was always saying snotty things about them, my suitcases, for instance. He kept saying they were too new and bourgeois. That was his favorite goddamn word. He read it or heard, heard it somewhere. Everything I had was bourgeois as hell. Even my fountain pen was bourgeois. He borrowed it off me all the time, but it was bourgeois anyway. We only roomed together for about two months, then we both asked to be moved. And the funny thing was, I sort of missed him after he moved because we had a hell of a good sense of humor and we had a lot of fun sometimes. I wouldn't be surprised if he missed me too. At first, he, he used to only be kidding when he would call my stuff bourgeois, and I didn't give a damn. It was sort of funny, in fact. Then after a while, you could tell he wasn't kidding anymore. The thing is, it's really hard to be roommates with people if your suitcases are much better than theirs. If yours are really good ones and theirs aren't, you think if they're intelligent and all, the other person, and have a good sense of humor, that they don't give a damn whose suitcases are better, but they do. They really do. It's one of those reasons why I roomed with stupid bastards like Stratler. At least his suitcases were as good as mine. Anyway, these two nuns were sitting next to me, and we sort of struck up a conversation. The one right next to me had on the had one of those straw baskets that you see nuns in Salvation Army babes collecting dough with around Christmas time. You see them standing on corners, especially on Fifth Avenue in front of the big department stores and all. Anyway, the one next to me dropped hers on the floor, and I reached down and picked it up for her. I asked her if she was out collecting money for charity and all. She said no. She said she couldn't get it in her suitcase when she was packing in and she was just carrying it. She had a pretty nice smile when she looked at you. She had a big nose and she had on those glasses with sort of iron rims that aren't too attractive, but she had a hell of a kind face. Uh, I thought you were taking up a collection, I told her. I could make a sm small contribution. You could keep the money for when you take up a collection. Oh, how very kind of you, she said. And the other one, her friend, looked over at me. The other one was reading a little black book while she drank her coffee. It looked like a Bible, but it was too skinny. It was a Bible-type book, though. All the two of them were eating for breakfast was toast and coffee. That depressed me. I hate it if I'm eating bacon and eggs or something and somebody else is only eating toast and coffee. They let me give them ten bucks as a contribution. They kept saying to me and asking me if I could afford it and all. I told them I had quite a bit of money with me, but they didn't seem to believe me. They took it, though, finally. The both of them kept thanking me so much it was embarrassing. I swung the conversation around to general topics and asked them where they were going. They said they were school teachers and they'd just come from Chicago and that they were going to start teaching at some convent on 168th Street or 186th Street or one of the streets way the hell uptown. The one next to me with the iron glasses said she taught English and her friend taught history in American government. Then I started wondering like a bastard what the one sitting next to me that taught English thought about being a nun and all when she read certain books for English. Books not necessarily with a lot of sexy stuff in them, but books with lovers in all of them. Take old Vi in The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. She wasn't too sexy or anything, but even so, you can't help wondering what a nun maybe thinks about when she reads about old Vi. I didn't say anything, though, naturally. All I said was English was my best subject. Oh, really? Oh, I'm so glad, the one with the glasses that taught English said. What have you read this year? I'd be very interested to know. She was very, she was really nice. Well, um, most of the time we were on the Anglo-Saxons, Beowulf and Old Grindel, the Lord Randall, my son, and all those things. But we had to read outside books for extra credit once in a while. I read The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy and Romeo and Julia and Julius. Oh, Romeo and Julia, lovely. Didn't she just love it? She certainly didn't sound much like a nun. Uh, yes, I did. I liked it a lot. There were a few things I didn't like about it, but it was quite moving on the whole. What didn't you like about it? Can you remember? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, it, it was to, well to tell you the truth, it was sort of embarrassing in a way to be talking about Romeo and Julia with her. I mean, the play gets pretty sexy in some parts, and she was a nun and all, but she asked me, so I discussed it with her. Uh, well, I'm not too crazy about Romeo and Juliet, uh, I said. I mean, I like them, but uh, I don't know. They get pretty annoying sometimes. I mean, I felt much sorrier when old Mercutio got killed than when Romeo and Juliet did. The thing is, I never liked Romeo too much after Mercutio gets stabbed by that other man, Juliet's cousin, what's his name? Tybalt. Uh, yeah, that's right, Tybalt, I said. I always forget that guy's name. It was Romeo's father. I mean, I liked him the best in the play, old Mercutio. I don't know, all those Montagues and Capulets, they're, they're all right, especially Juliet, but Mercutio, he was, you know, it's hard to explain. He was very smart and entertaining and all. The thing is, it drives me crazy if somebody gets killed, especially somebody very smart and entertaining, and that's somebody else's fault. Romeo and Juliet, at least it was their own fault. What school do you go to, she asked me. She probably wanted to get, the, get off the subject of Romeo and Juliet. I told her Pensy, and she'd heard of it. She said it was a very good school. I let it pass, though. Then the other one, the one that taught history and government, said that they better be running along. I took their check off them, but they wouldn't let me pay it. The one with the glasses made me give it back to her. 
You've been more than generous, she said. You're a very sweet boy. She certainly was nice. She reminded me a little bit of Ernest Morrow's mother, the one I met on the train, when she smiled mostly. We've enjoyed talking to you so much, she said. I said I enjoyed talking to them a lot, too. I meant it. I'd have enjoyed it more, though, I think, if I hadn't been sort of afraid the whole time I was talking to them that they'd all of a sudden try to find out if I was a Catholic. Catholics are always trying to find out if you're a Catholic. It happens to me a lot. I know partly because my last name is Irish, and most people of Irish descent are Catholics. As a matter of fact, my father was a Catholic once. He quit, though, when he married my mother. But Catholics are always trying to find out if you're a Catholic, even if they don't know your last name. I knew this one Catholic boy, Luis Shiny, when I was at the Wood School. He was the first boy I ever met there. He and I were sitting in the first two chairs outside the goddamn infirmary the day school opened, waiting for our physicals, and we sort of struck up a conversation about tennis. <clears throat> he was quite interested in tennis, and so was I. He told me he went to the Nationals at Forest Hills every summer, and I told him I did too. And then we talked about certain hotshot tennis players for, for, for a while. He knew quite a lot about tennis for a kid his age. He really did. Then after a while, right in the middle of the goddamn conversation, he asked me, uh, did you happen to notice where the Catholic Church is in town, by any chance? The thing was, you could tell the way he asked me that he wasn't try he was trying to find out if I was Catholic. He really was. Not that he was prejudiced or anything, but he just wanted to know. He was enjoying the conversation about tennis and all. But you could tell he would have enjoyed it more if I was Catholic and all. That kind of stuff drives me crazy. I'm not saying it ruined our conversation or anything. It didn't, but it sure as hell didn't do it any good. That's why I was glad those two nuns didn't ask me if I was Catholic. It would have spoiled the conversation if they had. But it would have been different, probably. I'm not saying I blame Catholics. I don't. I'd be the same way, probably, if I was a Catholic. It's just like those suitcases I was telling you about in a way. All I'm saying is, is that it's no good for a nice conversation. That's all I'm saying. When they got up, the two nuns, I did something very stupid and embarrassing. I was smoking a cigarette, and what I did, I said goodbye to them. By mistake, I blew some smoke in their face. I didn't mean to do it, but I did it and apologized like a madman. And they were very polite and nice about it, but it is very embarrassing. After they left, I started getting sorry that I'd only given them 10 bucks for their collection. But the thing was, I made that date to go on 